Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Yoka Gala's web seminar series titled Digital Oscilloscope Power Analysis Seminar. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to attend, and I hope you found this seminar helpful and informative. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some housekeeping issues. The audio part of this seminar can be accessed either through the teleconference number provided in the info tab of your WebEx Manager window or through the PC speakers. To hear the audio through your PC, select the Communicate tab and join the audio broadcast. The seminar will last approximately one hour. Towards the end of the presentation, where time permitting, we will have a Q&A section where our featured speaker, Barry Bowling, will answer some of the questions received from the audience. If your question is not answered during the presentation, please be assured that we will answer them via email. All questions should be submitted in the Q&A windows or the chat window located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Our featured presenter for this event is Barry Bowling, an application engineer with the High Frequency Instruments Division here at Yokogawa. For over 20 years and as a Georgia Tech degree electrical engineer, Barry has worked in both design and test capacities in the areas of power electronics, radio frequency, and analog electronics. Without further ado, I'll let's get started with the seminar by handing it over to Barry. Thank you, Sophia. Um, as uh, Sophia said, I have a background in uh, power supply, design and test, and uh, as well as analog and radio frequency electronics. So oscilloscopes are a very natural uh, support product for me. Um, so today we're going to look at um, a basic uh, switch mode power supply design called a flyback design and take a few sample measurements. We're going to look at other types of measurements that can be made too. And um, I'm going to show several examples and then discuss uh, a few of the challenges that are presented with making power supply measurements. There certainly are many. And uh, I'm going to have about three slides of uh, Yokogawa-specific solutions, including scopes, uh, probes, and a, and a special uh, piece of equipment called d skew box, a D-SKU signal source. So we'll explain that as well. I also do a, um, a probe seminar, too, which is uh, uh, very, very involved. So if you're making measurements on power supplies, be sure to attend uh, my probe seminar. Uh, I have a one-hour version of it. and uh, we look at many of the issues with probing, and many of those are applicable to uh, probing switch mode power supplies. Uh, as one example, I like to use a differential probe for, for most, if not all, of my voltage measurements, and uh, there are certainly some good reasons for that. So uh, be sure to look at the probe seminar. It's listed on the same website where you signed up for this uh, power supply measurement seminar. Okay. So a quick overview of switch mode power supplies but by now. Uh, uh, both veteran engineers and uh, newly degreed engineers are acquainted with these supplies and their designs. It has become easier and certainly more cost effective to put switch mode power supplies, so they're literally, literally showing up everywhere. Um, so they're small, they're thermally effective, they're very efficient, they're often very, very cost effective, uh, the components get smaller and more affordable, they weigh less, they provide better regulation. Um, initially, they are kind of complex design, uh, complex designs. Uh, they can have a high initial cost, and they can create radio frequency and high frequency noise. You certainly don't simply very easily put a switch mode power supply into a product. As a result, very often you'll see switch mode power supplies in a wall adapter type power supply to keep it out of your product. Okay, they show up everywhere, certainly at the consumer electronics level, both inside the box and outside the box of consumer electronics. They show up uh, in larger scale uh, in electric cars as uh, either DC to AC or AC to DC converters. They're certainly in IT telecom. And they're showing up in solar and windmill farms as well. In that case, you may be uh, converting to storing a battery or you may be converting to sync up with the, the power grid line. So these types of uh, measurements are, are almost everywhere. I've got a graphic here that shows, uh, basically, that demonstrates that we can convert almost any form of energy, electrical energy, to almost any other form of electrical energy. So I could convert from a battery, 
back up to AC. I maybe I could put that on the mains. I could convert from mains back to DC or back to AC. And uh, solar power or wind power can certainly be chopped or converted to almost anything. Okay. There are many measurements that you could take on a switch mode power supply. Um, I've highlighted a few in blue here that we're going to look at today. Uh, but here's a list of uh, about 20 or 30 different measurements. Uh, ripple current in the capacitor. You might do that to make sure that your capacitor's specifications are not being exceeded. Um, certainly all capacitors have a uh, peak current specification. Um, you might do dynamic load testing on your switch mode power supply, treating it as a black box. But you may want to look at uh, some board level measurements as well while you are suddenly uh, applying the load or suddenly removing the load. Um, you might look at the transient input response similarly uh, in terms of loading it. Um, load regulation, what happens when you change the load? Uh, what happens to your power or your, your voltage regulation in the case of a voltage supply or your current regulation in the case of a current supply? how it responds to line regulation. If, if your AC input uh, is perturbed, how much does the output change? Um, at more complex levels, you could do control loop response test on a uh, closed loop pulse with modulated power supply. So for today, we're going to do some pretty simple measurements just to introduce you to um, some of the concepts and also to a few solutions. So the whole point of a switch mode power supply is to take a, a commonly available uh, mains, usually a mains, in this case, say, 120 volts mains. You want to rectify it in this case, convert it, and create possibly isolation here. Here we have galvanic or, or, or uh, possibly optical isolation. Here we have galvanic isolation with a transformer, so you've created safety there, lower noise. And in this case, we're putting out a DC voltage. Let's very quickly follow the flow of energy from the mains to the DC output. So the mains are rectified, the energy is stored in a capacitor. Um, the, the, uh, the switch here is running, in our example today, about 90 kilohertz. So we're applying a pulsed current to this transformer. This stores the energy in a magnetic field for the transformer flux. The output, the secondary, is rectified and then stored in a capacitor, so it's again stored as an electric field. And at this point, it's regulated. We have a reference voltage that we compare the output of this pi filter to, and that reference voltage is uh, applied to a pulse width modulation circuit so that uh, you're able to adjust the output voltage on the switch mode power supply that way. So this is a closed loop switch mode power supply. Okay, so we've looked at uh, thus far the why, what can be measured, and an example in block diagram of a switch mode power supply. Let's look quickly at uh, several measurement examples. So we're back to our basic design here, a 90 kilohertz uh, switch mode power supply. This is called a flyback converter. This Converter is capable of either higher voltages or lower voltages than the peak main voltage. These are fairly common. Certainly, they're in many consumer electronic devices. So when the AC source is applied in an inrush test, we want to know how much stress this, um, this say, a fuse, this rectifier, this capacitor, uh, possibly even the transformer and, and uh, MOSFET switch here may be subject to some amount of stress. But mostly we're concerned with our input devices here. So what we want to do here is uh, connect the scope here, trigger off of the voltage, and then watch the current waveform. Uh, similarly, uh, this, this test is uh, performed because of the components, the, the, the fuse, the diode, and the capacitor. Will they live up to their MTBF? And with respect to the fuse in particular, we want to, we want to make sure that it's I squared T or its dual rating is not exceeded. Okay, here's a photograph of an inrush current setup. 
I've taken a differential probe. You'll, you'll see a different picture of it later. But here are the probes of a differential uh, probe. And I've got, a, got them connected to the main. One side is neutral, a black probe here. One side is the hot side, the red probe. I've got a current probe, and I've got the current sense on it in the proper direction. There's a little arrow there that points towards the power supply. That's a fuse block on the back diagram, so I'm in front of the fuse, right at the mains. I have an RFI EMI filter there that's made it pretty easy to access this uh, little switch mode uh, power supply here, a commercial design that I've modified for these measurements. So we're connecting voltage probe, current probe. I'm going to set up a trigger on the scope. Uh, you can trigger on either. Uh, I think I actually like to trigger on the current. I said earlier the voltage. I'll probably trigger on the current here, and you'll see in the next screenshot. We may want to run several trials of this. Uh, because in current depends on the state of the input capacitor, of your input uh, rectifier capacitor or filter circuit. If that capacitor has a little bit of charge on it, you won't have as much inrush current. Also, um, the inrush current would depend on whether or not your power supply turned on during the zero crossing, or if it turned on during the peak, your 120 volt RMS mains may be at a peak voltage at the time, or at the very instant when you turn. Uh, or, or apply the voltage to your switch mode power supply. Uh, the test setup is very simple. We need an oscilloscope, current probe or current transformer, and a voltage probe, possibly an isolation transformer. So here's my test result. I measured on this very small power supply, 25 amps peak for just a very short duration. Uh, on this DLM2000 oscilloscope screenshot, I've got 12 and a half million points. Um, across this one one cycle, almost one cycle, um, or, or, or slightly longer than one cycle acquisition. So we could zoom in on this. I haven't done it in the screenshot, but certainly I have enough data points to zoom in on this, and I could more accurately measure uh, the area under the curve there and, and, and calculate the amount of actual energy that was uh, uh, applied or was absorbed during this test. Um, I can also move the current probe over to the capacitor that might require some modifications to the power supply, but I could measure the, the input, uh, the inrush current or the ripple current as well into the input capacitor. Um, so you might use the same connections too for steady state current tests or your dynamic load test if you want to watch the current to the input of your switch mode supply uh, during a dynamic load change. Again, the ripple current and other line measurements, which we'll discuss later. So here's a close-up of this screenshot. Um, at some point, I'll add a, a zoom here. The, the Yokogawa scopes have really fantastic zoom. So with 12 and a half million points here, I could I could zoom down to uh, probably just several hundred or a thousand of these data points here and look very closely at this inrush current. But here you can see on the voltage supply on the mains that there actually was a little glitch here. Um, looks like almost 30 or 40 volts of, of sag, uh, instantaneous sag. Okay, so my next measurement will be switching loss. And switching loss is energy. We use the uh, small letter W. Um, if you're new to this, you may think of W as commonly being used for watts. In, in, in the power analysis world, W is energy or joules, and the units that we most commonly use are watt hours. And uh, I would point out, if you multiplied out watt hours, you would end up with joules. So again, that's just, just to reinforce the idea that we're measuring energy. We want to know if the design is operating efficiently and how much energy is lost uh, uh, during the switching transitions. Okay, we've moved our probes. In this case, I'm on the same power supply that you saw earlier, a commercially available supply. It's a little board here you can see. It's got a heat sink. I put in a loop of wire on the, uh, the, the drain or the source side of the MOSFET. I prefer to be on the low side, and uh, in my probing seminar, I'll, I'll discuss why I do that. Um, but with the current probe um, between ground and uh, the drain of this MOSFET. Um, on the differential probe, I'm just simply across the drain and the supply. So I'm measuring, or the source rather. So I'm measuring V, DS, the drain.
applying the source voltage, and I'm measuring I sub D, or the drain current. Okay, so it's a pretty simple setup. I did have to put this loop of wire in here. I cut the board and soldered in that loop of wire. Okay, and then we turn on the power supply and watch the current through it. Um, the result is watt hours. I've got the result right there. It's 1.68 nano watt hours. And that is the amount of energy that is um, passed during uh, through the MOSFET during during this this between these pair of cursors here. So uh, this is the transition ohm time. The time between T1 and T2, and we'll, we'll come to this equation in a moment, but that period of time there is called the transition ohm time. Here the MOSFET is off. The voltage uh, across the drain source is high. The MOSFET is turned on. And the, the V sub Vf quickly, quickly is pulled close to ground. The current ramps up. Uh, the, the primary of the transformer behaves as an inductor, and it's almost an ideal ramp there. And um, the product of these two waveforms is produced down here in a mass channel of the scope. Again, the turn-on loss is graphed as a little horn. And the, the integral here calculates uh, drain to source voltage times drain current uh, across time. So we're measuring the area under that little horn near the curve. Here's the transition off switching. The horn is a little larger, and uh, the area under the curve there is at least double what I've measured here. So in this case, I've measured uh, transition on loss is 1.68 nanowatt hours. So a similar test here would be turn off loss, the area under the second horn. Um, or cycle loss, I may want to measure from uh, the beginning of one full cycle on the left here to the very end. In other words, I would measure the current uh, or the energy uh, dissipate, uh, dissipated under the, both horns in the, the on region here. So turn on plus on time plus turn off would be the total of a cyclic loss measurement. So here's a close-up of that same screenshot. Here the transistor's off, voltage is high, if the transistor's off, the current is low. Here's the turn on loss measurement up close. And the result is numerical. It's shown over here on the right column. I can do more than one test at a time. And those results are shown in the column here. This scope is a DL9000. If we go with DL9000. Okay, I mentioned cycle loss, and you'll notice in this screenshot, uh, I'm doing a cycle mode. Uh, the cool thing here is, and, and there's my result, 12.2 nanowatt hours. And um, there's no indication here that I'm in cycle mode, but I went into a menu and turned on cycle mode. So again, it's measuring the total uh, energy under this I times V curve. And there's no cursors. I actually have a cursor way off to the left here is pushed out of my way and a cursor here. I could apply those cursors if I wish, but the, the Yokogawa scope will find uh, the, the beginning of each cycle and the end of each cycle. And you can also take manual control of that too if you wish. Okay, um, all of our scopes are capable of trending. Trending is sort of a recorder feature, but we put it into scopes. So what I mean by that is um, up on the top three waveforms here, I've got channel one, voltage. I've got channel two, current. I've got the instantaneous power uh, in my math channel. This is math one. This scope has eight or seven math channels. And um, down here is another result. Well, this is W sub P. This is the energy, uh, a graph of the energy trend over many different acquisitions. Um, in this case here, I'm doing uh, about 100, about 100 acquisitions. You can do up to 10, you can do, you can do up to 100,000 acquisitions, and uh, these events uh, are aligned in time. Uh, that event occurred, and, and you're not you're unable to see when I created this event. But what it, what the event was, I applied uh, an extra load. I increased the load just instantaneously on the output of the switch mode supply. And I was able to, to graph uh, the, the watt hours 
uh, through this MOSFET. Okay. Here's the power loss per cycle. In this case, we're talking about watts. And in this case, the scope is calculating this integral using the voltage and the current waveform. This is the average power uh, integral, and it's 1 over the period times the integral from T1 to T2 of the voltage times the current with respect to time. So this average is it because you're dividing by one period. This just creates an average. It's the same equation, the same integral uh, as energy, but now we're dividing by time. So that creates um, joules per second or watts. Um, by its definition, it is already an average. Sometimes you'll hear someone say average power, and power is already averaged. So it's, it's a misnomer to say this. And it is equivalent to the heat dissipated by the switching device. In this case, I'm measuring the drain to source voltage or the voltage across uh, the, the drain and source of the MOSFET, and then the drain current, which is the same here. The drain current I'm measuring at the source because it's the low side, and it's a cleaner, uh, less, less noisy measurement to make with the current probe. This measurement is important because it's equivalent to the amount of heat that this transistor is dissipating, either instantaneously or for longer period measurements. So there's a number of uh, instances where you would make this measurement. You might also do it in an environmental chamber. So any of these measurements can be uh, permutated by other conditions, such as temperature. So there's a picture of the test set up. Uh, drain the source voltage. And I have the current probe on the source side of the MOSFET, so that's the drain current. And here's my result. It's, uh, it's the same waveform. I've simply calculated a different integral. In this case, we're dissipating about 4 watts of, 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 of power. And that's heat, again, dissipated in that transistor. The scope I used here was the Yokogawa DL9000. And, um, Channel 1, again, was the drain to source. Channel 2, the green uh, sweep here, is the um, drain current. This is my mass channel where I've multiplied the two. And then, of course, uh, I've scaled them. And then this is my, my, my power measurement in watts. Okay. Uh, measurement example 4 is safe operating area. And... Um, in this case, uh, the safe operating area for a MOSFET is simply uh, the drain current at, at any instant graft against the drain to source voltage at that same instant. So at any instant, your, your MOSFET, depending on how you're switching it and um, the rate at which you're switching it, you'll have a I or a current voltage data pair. It could be plotted anywhere on this this map. Ideally, it would need to stay inside of these lines that we've drawn here as the safe operating area. So this is an XY plot, and, and most scopes are capable of this. Um, in the case of the Yokogawa um, power analysis feature, we, we set up the safe operating area inside of that, uh, that package. So here's the parameters, or absolute maximum ratings for the MOSFET, which you've seen in the picture, and the drain to source voltage maximum is 30 volts. And the uh, drain current maximum, absolute maximum drain current is 30 amps. In the case of a two-channel device, it may be more, but let's assume 30 amps here. And then the continuous source drain current would be uh, significantly less, so one amp. Okay, so I've simply turned on the XY mode here to plot this. Channel one, the X axis, the horizontal axis, is voltage, drain source voltage. The Y trace, channel two, is the drain current, I sub D. And as you can see, I've put uh, several cursors in here. Um, X1 is zero volts, so it goes at times slightly below zero volts. And that's probably the transformer flyback ringing a little bit. 
and I've set a maximum of 430 volts. These have been scaled for a different bomb set, actually. But uh, in, in any event, you can see that I've, I've plotted, and I've also been able to draw a, uh, a safe operating area here. I don't have little corners here. We'd probably have to just put some markers or tick marks on there to accommodate that measurement. Okay, power quality. When I say power quality, uh, I'm generally referring to harmonics. And each of our scopes with the power analysis package is capable of doing uh, a performing pre-compliance test uh, to IEC 61000. In, in particular, 3-2, which is the current uh, measurement, the harmonic current. And um, at the same time, we'll talk about apparent power, or symbol S, and the units are volt amps. Uh, at this, at, as a line measurement here, the voltage and the current will be measured. You can also calculate your average power, much like we just did in the MOSFET. The symbol for that is P, and I use W for watts, capital W here. And then reactive power, uh, the symbol for which is capital letter Q, and um, the units are VAR, volt amp reactive, also power factor, or lambda. So these are all line level measurements made here. Typically, you would use an IEC uh, approved, you know, AC source. So here we are back to the RFI EMI input filter with the differential probe here and the current probe with the proper current sense arrow pointing towards the power supply. And a uh, pretty simple test setup, which you've seen earlier. Okay, so here's a graph of uh, just several cycles of steady state voltage and current input. And then, um, in this case, uh, again, power, instantaneous power, I times V plotted down at the bottom. Um, in this case, we have S total power equal to 49 and a half volt amps. And P on channel 1 or power calculated is 42.1 watts, capital Q, um, 25.9 bar, and the power factor is 0 0.85, which certainly is a, a decent power factor by standards. Here are the equations. These are all IEEE uh, approved measurement or, or methodology, and uh, as published by the IEEE, including the power factor, the true definition of power factor, is uh, the power in watts divided by S in volt amps. There's no phase measurement or, or phase angle measured in this calculation. It's the P divided by S. Okay. So the harmonics, yes, IEC 61000 test is very easy on the Yokogawa um, harmonics analysis. When you come in here, you, you select uh, the, the, the type of test. There's uh, a class A test that we're running here, and that test is applied to certain devices, uh, and, and the IEC defines these. So one, one class is maybe motors, another class is computers or consumer electronics. In this case, I'm running a class A test. I've got it displaying in log mode here, again, class A. And this is C2. I'm running this test because IEC is a current or harmonic current. So I'm, I'm just simply doing an FFT on this current waveform. And this, this current waveform is authentic. You can see that um, I have little peaks of current um, at the top of each waveform there. So that's a, a diode capacitor input with a switcher on it. And um, there's, there's a lot of a lot of noise, a lot of harmonics that you can see visually that surely must be there. And, and certainly after you do the harmonics analysis or the FFT, you can see each of the harmonics displayed as a green line here. I've got, uh, looks like small odd, har even harmonics and large odd harmonics. Okay, so the violet box here, the rectangle here, is the template for pass-fail. If my actual measurement exceeds that violet box, then I violated the IEC 61000 standard for that test and for that class. So 
this, this, this screenshot shows a passed test. And then here it is, just displayed by itself. So you can get a little closer look. And it's a logarithmic uh, display. You can do it in linear as well. Okay, here's a tabular format. In this case, we failed uh, a test on purpose to create a no-go under the info. So it's another easy test. It shows the measurement of each order harmonic and then um, also the limit of each order harmonic and then your actual measurement in percent. In this case, I have a limit of 0 0.07 on the ninth harmonic and I have a measurement of 0 0.073. So I exceeded uh, with the, the limit with a measurement of about 5% over. 5% um, no go. So that's a failed IEC 61,000 harmonic test. And this is a pre-compliance test. You would want to do this sort of testing before you sent your product uh, to a, a house that is set up for, or a test house that's set up for IEC test. Okay, so that concludes our measurement examples. I have uh, a couple of measurement challenges to introduce to you as well, one of which is SKU. Um, before I get into the topic of SKU, I want to point out that I made most of my measurements here with a differential probe. In this case, it was required. But in the case of making switch mode power supplies, I would lean towards using the differential probe at all times. This is a 100 megahertz probe. So first of all, you've got a uh, good bandwidth there. A passive probe simply cannot offer that. I've got plenty of voltage range. This gives me the freedom to put that probe or connect it to just about anything on that board. Uh, but more importantly than those two things, a differential probe uh, with its low side or the black lead here gives you a non-ground uh, uh, test uh, method of test. So what I mean by that is you can avoid creating ground loops. If I was using a passive probe and I connect the ground lead to it, I've now grounded the scope, which is already grounded uh, to, to, the, to the grid. I've now grounded my switch mode power supply and my scope together back to the grid. So I've created a ground loop there. That typically will offer a place for currents to flow out of the switch mode supply ground plane back into the grid uh, ground line uh, and vice versa. So what you end up with is noise and it affects your measurement. So a diff probe really is the way to go uh, with any switch mode power supply measurements even if they're single-ended measurements. In the case of making differential measurements with a differential probe, you end up with the higher performance in terms of common mode rejection ratio. So again, even with differential measurements, you reduce the amount of noise that you'll have in your measurements. Okay, so what is skew? It's kind of an odd word. Um, uh, and certainly a, a lot of new engineers are new, you know, may not have heard it. But SKU simply is the propagation delay difference between the current clamp and your voltage probe. Specifically, the current clamp is going to have a longer propagation delay. The amount of time it takes for a waveform, in this case on a, on a loop of wire, a current, to propagate through the electronics and the magnetics in the current clamp head, down the coax, and into the scope. It's typically in the picoseconds or possibly nanoseconds range. A voltage probe, a passive probe, or an active probe, either one is going to have no magnetics in it, simpler circuitry, and possibly a shorter lead here. In the case of this one, looks a little shorter. The propagation delay almost uniformly is shorter. So what that means is the waveform on a voltage probe will get to your scope before the waveform from a current clamp, or CT, gets to your scope. That is called skew. Skew is simply the delay time difference. In this case, I've put a couple of arrows here to demonstrate uh, on, a, on a square wave that's applied to each channel. I've applied a square wave current that's in sync with a square wave voltage to this scope and displayed it on this scope. This is a BL7400, a Yokogawa scope. And um, you can see that the yellow waveform, the voltage waveform, gets there just nanoseconds ahead of the green waveform, the current waveform. Okay, so how do we fix this? We fix this by delaying the voltage waveform, usually just by 
three or four or five nanoseconds. But we need a test source. So we have a DSKU box. The DSKU box offers a 15 kilohertz square wave voltage that's in sync with a 15 kilohertz square wave current. They're in sync already. They certainly should reach the scope at the same time. The scope will automatically de-skew itself. You just connect a voltage probe to the voltage pins on the de-skew box and a current probe to the current loop on the de-skew box. Hit auto de-skew button, and then these two waveforms will be lined up. You also have the option to do it manually or adjust the outcome of the automatic de-skew. So now that we've explained what de-skew is and how to correct it, I'm going to show you a quick example of why we need to do it. If we were measuring sine waves with the voltage current probe pair, we would have uh, very little to worry about. Any calculations performed with those sine waves will usually prove to be um, not a problem. The errors just do not accumulate as rapidly as they would with any sort of waveform that has a very fast rise time or a square edge on it. So. My point there is if you were measuring, um, you know, switch, switched type waveforms, switching waveforms, you'll have fast rise times and you will have errors. In this case, I intentionally uh, took a measurement. In this case, in the center uh, screenshot here, I'm de-skewed, and my measurement came out to be 569 milliwatts of dissipated power in the MOSFET. In this case, uh, I introduced plus five nanoseconds of skew on purpose. I did that with the scope. And I came out with about a 5% error in my, in my calculation of power. Well, 5% by itself is not much, but when we add that to the error that the probe and the scope offers already, these are eight-bit instruments after all, we need all the accuracy we can get. But when I add up all those errors, I might be up in the six or seven or eight percent range by now. So it's best to eliminate the biggest error and in this case, it would be skewed. So likewise, I introduced five nanoseconds of skew, and I ended up with uh, about 5% error on the, the power measurement again. So it, it's not a rule of thumb. Five nanoseconds is not always 5% error. But the, the point that I want you to take away from here is that a very small skew of five nanoseconds made a fairly significant error. Okay. So here's just a couple of photographs. If you own a Yokogawa scope and an auto skew box, um, this is how you connect your probe. The current probe here, this is a Yokogawa probe. And then uh, the differential probe here, you can do this with a single-ended probe as well. And then you hit uh, de-skew, and it will align the two waveforms. And you'll, you'll definitely see the difference in your measurements. And you'll also see the measurement. Uh, the, the difference in the waveforms on the screen. Okay, there's one other measurement challenge that actually is, is quite important as well. Because an oscilloscope is an 8-bit instrument, your dynamic range is um, around 50 dB. And by that I mean going from measuring a voltage waveform here, the yellow waveform. During my power analysis, at one point I measure here, this may be 200 volts. When I go from, from measuring 200 volts to measuring something very close to ground without changing my volts per division setting, and, and while using an 8-bit instrument, I have a significant error down here. I, I, I may not mind. I may just be making some rough measurements, and that may be fine. But if I really want to refine my measurements, I'll draw a line here, a threshold that says, okay, below this voltage or this current range, I want the scope to assume a, a given value there. And the scope permits you to assign that value. So again, the measurement challenge here is dynamic range. The solution is to intervene with a feature that allows you to tell the scope what values to use in its calculations down here below these reference values. So again, you have a voltage error, and you have a current error as well. Okay. The, the Yokogawa scope actually gives you a diagram that's very similar, similar to what we've studied today. 
In other words, you have a voltage waveform, it's a yellow trace, and you have a current waveform, I, that's a green trace. You come into this uh, level setup and you tell it, okay, this is a bipolar or BJT transistor, or it's a MOSFET. In this case, I've set up a MOSFET, and I have the drain to source resistance value that I've taken off of the, uh, the specifications sheet for that MOSFET, and I've assigned that value in here. And then I tell it what level of current to use, the reference level. And I tell it what reference level of voltage to use in there as well. So the scope will substitute those values during the, 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 the conduction or switching loss measurements or the power loss measurements. Okay. So here's, here's, six, here's a list of six things that you can do to further improve your measurements. Um, I haven't mentioned it, but uh, current probes need to be demagnetized. That's a built-in feature. Uh, they'll drift um, over time, so they need to be demagnetized during each session. As a result, they'll need to be zeroed during each session as well. And um, our scopes will do both automatically at the push of one button. Um, so be on the lookout for residual magnetism. Just make a checklist uh, to yourself to, to do these things during any measurement sessions. Uh, be sure to zero both the voltage and the current probes regularly. Use a high-resolution acquisition mode if you can. Um, each of our current production scopes has high-resolution mode, and that's a method uh, that takes an 8-bit uh, measurement up to either 9 or 10 or 11 or 12 bits of resolution. And uh, it's an averaging-type method. Uh, your waveform does not have to be, it's not required that your waveform be a uh, repetitive waveform, and uh, this can improve your dynamic range a little bit, and certainly the, the repeatability of your measurements. At the front end of the scope, use bandwidth limiting if you can. This is applicable to all scope measurements. If you have a one gigahertz scope um, and you're making measurements down below 10 megahertz, set your filter somewhere close to that maybe 20 megahertz or maybe 100 megahertz, uh, there's, there's no real need to see all of the noise contributed uh, by the building or the industrial area that your lab is in or maybe even by the airport. Uh, you've got radar down there and things that can show up on oscilloscopes. And remember that every probe is also an antenna. So use the, use the bandwidth limiter on your scope. Take advantage of the differential voltage probes. I've mentioned the issue of common mode rejection ratio and cleaner, more noise-free measurements, and also the ground loop that you create with a passive probe. So uh, differential voltage probes uh, up to a meg 100 megahertz are actually very affordable, and they offer some protection uh, to you as well so that you don't inadvertently tie a passive probe uh, lead uh, to a non-ground reference point. With a differential voltage probe, you have the freedom to put either of those two probes on basically any, any circuit that you want or any test point that you want uh, within reason. Okay, so uh, here's one more tip. We didn't really cover ripple measurements today, but if you want to make ripple measurements, all of our scopes have a good offset or an offset cancel feature. That means if I want to measure the ripple on um, 100 volts DC, I can dial in 100 volts DC and, and measure and the, the ripple on a test point with 100 volts DC on it. Um, that permits me to um, set the volts per division more sensitive and, and take advantage of the analog to digital converter dynamic range in that setting. Um, if you have any questions about any of these tips, Feel free to email me or call me. You're going to see my, my contact info here in just a few more slides. Okay, Yokogawa Solutions. I've got three slides here on um, scopes that are currently in production. Uh, of course, we offer scopes, options such as power analysis. Um, we have power options on the front of the scope as well as on the back of our scopes. So you can use a variety of different probes. Usually these are required for the differential probe. You've got a, uh, this, this one can be battery powered. It can be powered from the scope. It can also be powered 
from a wall power supply adapter. Most of our current probes are going to have a, a LEMO connector here, so that would connect to, to power on the back of the scope. And that can be used with other scopes as well. Um, if, you, if you buy a Yokogawa current probe, we could sell you a separate power supply that would allow you to, to move around a bit with your current probe. So we have, of course, passive probes, but also di di differential probes and current probes or current transformers, um, including a catalog of very, very accurate current probes and CTs. And we also have high voltage probes. In the case of an IEC uh, harmonics test, you're going to need an AC source. In the case of a uh, pre-compliance IEC test, uh, you, you may not require that AC source. Okay, so here's our current uh, scope line. Um, I don't have any of my recorders on here, but uh, we have a SB5000, which is actually a serial bus analyzer, but it actually also has the option of power supply analysis. And uh, then we have the DLM2000. We've got uh, several flavors to choose from there, about six different models to accommodate your bandwidth requirement. Uh, these models also have a flex MSO input. In other words, they have eight bits of logic on the input, and they do serial bus analysis as well. This is probably my favorite scope. Uh, we have an eight-channel scope that also does power supply analysis, so it can do four pairs of voltage current um, waveforms. So you can do three-phase measurements with it. Um, and the DL9000, um, which also offers um, mixed mix logic. So you can have uh, 16 or 32 bits of logic on it as well. All of our scopes are 8 bits. Each of these scopes uh, also offers the high-resolution mode, uh, except for the DL7400. Okay. And then here's a product spotlight. Um, we've had this scope out almost two years now, and uh, it has proven to be very, very popular. Um, if you're interested in, in testing one of these, uh, shoot me an email. Ask me qu questions about it. We have enough of these out in the field, uh, and there's one local to you. If, if you're interested in playing with one of these for a couple of days, let me know. Uh, again, these come in 200. 350 and 500 megahertz bandwidth. We have a four-channel model, a two-channel model, super, super long memory. I don't think there's another scope on the market with this uh, uh, 125 mega points of memory. Very small footprint. I always kind of liken it to an iMac. Um, it is a, a, a new or different to some vertical orientation. It's an orientation uh, that I've, I've come to like a lot. Uh, and again, the Flex MSO, we have a connector here that permits a logic input. Real-time digital filtering, and of course, serial bus analysis. And um, that's pretty much it on that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the uh, power supply measurement seminar. If there was anything that was unclear, or if you just want to discuss one of your measurement challenges, be sure to contact me. I'll leave this information here on the screen for a moment. And uh, that concludes my seminar. Thank you, Barry, for a wonderful seminar. We have run out of time for a Q&A section, but please be assured that if you submit a question, they will be answered via the email. Also, if you have not yet answered the poll questions, I would request you to please do so at this time. I would like to mention that the seminar was recorded and will be available for replaying in archive form 24 to 48 hours under the technical library of our webpage. I will be sending everyone a link when it is up for your viewing tomorrow by email. Thank you once again, and we hope to see you online at our future web seminars.